Yeah, so Margie says the governor of Michigan's forcing us all to wear useless masks to go anywhere to get groceries, gas, or medicine, or we can be turned away. It's ridiculous. It's it really is ridiculous. A mask is not going to stop the spread. I, I, you know, I talked about this a little bit last week, and and you know, we mentioned if 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 the governments are forcing everyone to wear a mask, why don't you see the president wearing a mask? Why don't you see Fauci or Dr. Birx when they're up there on those podiums? wearing masks or when they step down from the podium, putting their mask on when they're, you know, when they're convening. And why don't you see any of them social distancing? You know, again, it's, 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 it's kind of a creepy time to be alive in America. We never thought we would see uh, this type of stuff happening. So Sandra says, eat local and you don't have to worry about what supermarket has on its shelves. Yeah, but you got to worry about whether or not the local food is going to be sequestered by the government. Because one of the things that can happen, it's not, it, it's again, prepare for this, folks. I'm, I'm just warning you, you need to be prepared for this. What happened when COVID hit is the government stepped in and declared, in a sense, not martial law, but declared restriction of your freedoms, restriction of your ability to move about. Restriction of your ability to take care of yourself, to earn a living. Restriction of your ability to go anywhere. Um, restriction of your ability to exercise. All the gyms were closed. Now, you certainly you could exercise outside, but some people were trying to exercise outside and some people were getting arrested. So the governments stepped in very readily and didn't find that restricting your rights was at all beyond their scope after that declaration of emergency. What do you think is going to happen to your local food production If your government decides that they need that food. So just like they seized your right to move, you think they're not going to seize, take the, take the action to seize your local food production? Don't count on, uh, on you know, again, I, I, I mean, I'm not trying to be political with any of you tonight, so please don't read anything political into this. I have my opinions. You probably all have your opinions as well. We all do. Um, if you're trusting that the government is going to take care of your personal needs, you've got a very, very wrong idea about how the world works. The government doesn't keep your personal needs at the top of their priority list. The government is going to take and they're going to redistribute that food where they see fit. So don't depend. I mean, yes, Buy local, try to support your local farmers. I'm not saying not to do that, but don't rely on it as the sole source when you aren't taking care of, of your needs. Again, my advice to you is, is that you really should be stocking up. And look, I'm not trying to be an alarmist here. I'm not trying to say that the sky is falling. I, I, I certainly don't believe that. I'm just trying to say be prepared, okay, for the potential of a worst case scenario. Because if you are, you can sleep easier at night, and if it does happen, you're prepared. But if it doesn't happen, it will be too late to prepare. It's kind of like, let's just use an analogy that many of you with autoimmune disease it struggled for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. You weren't prepared to keep your body healthy because you were making decisions. And part of the reason you weren't prepared is because you didn't have the knowledge, right? So knowledge, the knowledge barrier was your excuse for not preparing or for not being healthy. Well, you know, for a lot of people, that knowledge barrier and something like this is, is another reason that they're going to give when they don't have anything if something does happen. Now you don't have the excuse. What I'm trying to do is, is, is I'm trying to back you into a corner where you no longer have the excuse that knowledge was not at your fingertips where you knew that you should or could take action on this. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, so Sammy says 90% of people are going to lose weight or cut down. Please don't cause a panic. No panic. I'm not panicked. Uh, the panic will happen. Raise your hand if you've ever seen starving people react. So the panic occurs when the food is low or gone, unavailable. You want to see real panic in the streets? This is when you're going to see real panic. Not panic is not preparing. Don't try to call me. Uh, don't try to call me an alarmist. Panic is when people don't have the food because something beyond their control either seizes the food or doesn't allow for the food to be produced. But if you really want to see the world turn chaotic really, really fast, take away the food. It's the number one thing you could do 
to, to create alarm and warfare in a very, very quick way. And crime, you can't imagine the, the potential for crime when the food is gone. People will, it will be out in masses. So again, I'm not, I'm not saying that that will happen. I'm saying let's all work together and be intelligent and prepare so that it doesn't happen. And one of the ways that you can prepare is to make sure you have adequate food to feed yourself and your family, and then you won't be part of the panicking masses uh, if it does come down to that. Let's see here. Leslie asked me, why do I trust those numbers? What numbers are you referring to, Leslie, um, when you ask me why I trust those numbers? Um, be clear on that, and I can give you my opinion. Okay. What are some good ways to store healthy food? So that's a good question, Linda. Um, some of the best things that you can do, dried meat, if, you know, if you're a vegetarian, of course, any kind of canned vegetables, canned fruits, um, those types of things, canned goods can stay, can stay um, fresh, well, not fresh, but can stay from, keep from rotting or keep for multiple years and, and you know, five plus years for most of them, even though they may have a shelf life or an, ex, uh, 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 an expiration date that's much sooner than that, they can stay good for a really long time. So canning, if you have your own garden and you, you can do some of your own canning, you can use mason jars uh, and you can, you know, you can seal you know, a number of different vegetables that you might grow in your garden and seal those for use later if you have excess in your garden. Um, you know, dried meats, if you've got access to, to meat you, and you have a food dehydrator, you can dry meats, you can dry fruits if they're currently fresh, you can dry them and make jerky from them or you can dry the fruit uh, because that, those will keep for uh, quite an extended period of time. Nuts are a, great, are a great thing to also keep on hand because they're high in calories. And so they're going to provide you with a lot of calories for nourishment, but also easy to store. And they have a really long shelf life as well. And that's if you buy them in the shell, as opposed to buying them uh, already shelled, then they even have a longer shelf life. Let's see here. Recommendations on where to buy seeds. Uh, right now, I mean, there are a number of places that are carrying seeds. If you're talking about organic produce seeds, you can actually find them at Lowe's. You can find them at Home Depot, which are major stores. You can also find them at some of the local seed distributors and local, um, and some of the local uh, gardening supply centers are a good place as well. Uh, and then you can find them online. There's a number of seed uh, banks online where you can order but again, my advice to you right now is if you can buy it physically, buy it physically. If, if, because if, if, you know, if, if um, something's not delivered because of delays or because of employees not showing up to work because they're sick or whatever, you don't know when, it, when things right now are taking longer to ship. So if you've got the opportunity to buy it local, I would say definitely buy it local. Uh, Monica asks, so give us a list of things that we should have in our homes. Um, a list of things. So when it comes to food, taste is part of it. If you have, if, if you have the availability to choose the things that you like, but you know, beggars also can't be choosers. Uh, you know, what I would recommend is canned meats. So things like tuna, things like sardine or, or oysters, uh, even canned chicken, things of that nature, you know, easy, long storage shelf life, dried meats or jerkies are easy to store. You can store those in the house, plenty of canned goods, uh, vegetables and fruits, Again, pick the variety that you like so when you're buying the canned versions. Try to find organic versions. Again, a big part of preparing is preparing to eat healthy, not necessarily preparing to eat unhealthy. We want to keep you as healthy as possible. Should there be a problem or should there be a shortage? Um, you don't stock up so much on fresh food. Corinne says, how do you stock up on fresh food? Y you can if you have a, a deep freeze. And, and so those of you who do have a freezer or a deep freeze where you can store a little bit of extra, that might not be a bad idea is to, is to buy a little bit of extra fresh meats that you can freeze. Um, even certain types of, of uh, fruits or things, fresh fruits that you can actually freeze. Strawberries freeze well, blueberries freeze well. So there are now, again, a number of fruits or vegetables that you could freeze again, but you're going to need the storage space for that. So if you don't have a deep freezer, they're really hard to come by right now. I mean, if that doesn't tell you anything about what people are, are thinking, what a lot of people are thinking is that to get a deep freeze right now, there's like a three to four month waiting list just to be able to purchase one. So if you've got one, make sure you're utilizing the space that you already have. And again, you can freeze things. Um, let's see here. Yeah, it does. It helps to have a vegetable garden every summer. It absolutely does. If you've got the place to do a garden, I recommend that you do a garden. I, the thing about it is right now, if you don't have a garden, it, it's not that it's too late to start one. You can certainly start one, but 
Um, there's a steep learning curve to gardening if you've never done it. I mean, there's bugs and there's worms and there's all different kinds of pests and things that can get in your crop. There's all different kinds of things that you will learn as you experience gardening year after year after year. There's a, again, there's just a huge learning curve. So in times of pandemic and times of emergency, that's not the time to begin learning. My advice would be start learning now, certainly, but, but, um, in, and get it going as soon as possible. But, um, you know, you can't plant a garden in a pandemic and have immediate food. That's not the way growing food works. It takes months and it takes prep and you have to know about soil amendments and you have to know about soil pH and you have to know about the quality of the soil and you have to know about composting. Like there's a huge learning curve for that. And if it's not something that you have any skill set with right now, currently, then you're not going to grow enough food before the fall hits should there be a shortage of food in the fall. So again, it doesn't mean don't start learning right now about how to do it by COVID-19 then let's say New York City. Um, but we our still our sh grocery store shelves are still not full. We still don't have an endless variety and endless choices. And so again, you know, that's an observation. I talked last week about, you know, about critical thinking and using your brain and observing the world around you. And this is an example of observing the world. I'm glad Sherry brought it up that if you look at what's happening, the store shelves are not filling back up rapidly. Why is that? Is it because there's already a potential uh, shortage or supply break? You know, you're not going to get an honest answer out of a politician. I think you should all be aware of that, at least at this point, you're not going to get an honest answer. The, 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 the canned answer from any politician, no matter what side of the aisle you're on, is always going to be whatever the response is, just make sure you don't incite panic. Um, if, if somebody says we're having a food shortage, what's the first thing that's going to happen is everybody's going to run to the store and the shelves are going to be empty. Again, I'm not saying that there's going to be a food shortage. I'm just telling you that you should be thinking about planning for one potentially and, and making sure you're taken care of. AJ wants to know how many months of food do you think we need to have? I don't think anybody can give a perfect answer to that, AJ. I, I would say, you know, two to three months, if you, if you can afford it, if you've got the space to store it, I'd say that'd be a good place to start and anything above and beyond that. Uh, but, but that would be, in my opinion, a, a bare minimum for my, for my personal comfort level. I'll just say it like that. Um, let's see. Do you grow a garden and can in your spare time? Uh, do I? Um, yeah, I have some spare time that I, I do have a garden. So yes, um, which is why I know a little bit about it. I mean, I'm, I'm by no means am I a master gardener, but I know more than the average person about food growth and prep. Um, love some of the comments we're getting here. Let's see. So somebody mentioned chickens, and I think... Um, that's phenomenally uh, good. Now, now I will say this: if if you don't know much about chickens, chickens are like a dual a dual benefit. So you know, even if you live in the city, and depending on your city's laws, chickens can be a great way uh, to have an ongoing food source. Um, so one of the things you can do with chickens, obviously, is you can eat them, but you can also in my opinion, the more important aspect to a chicken is you can get eggs from them. So if you're not allergic to eggs, and if you're allergic to chicken eggs, you might, you know, ducks, another good option. But again, you, if you don't need a ton of space for chickens, there's actually a lot of preppers online that do backyard chickens. So you, you need very little space to actually own a chicken or to own a few chickens. And most chickens, uh, if you get a good layer, a good a bird that lays really good, really solidly, uh, and there are a number of different varieties of chickens, um, but they're going to lay anywhere in, in, in their prime. They're going to lay about an egg a day, um, and not 100% of the time, but about an egg a day. So if you have four or five chickens, imagine you get you know, four or five eggs a day on, on, um, you know, on average. That's, that's a lot of food to help feed your family. But chickens are also awesome pets. Um, <laughs> I'm a little biased in that way because I have, you know, I have some chickens. And uh, they're, they're very, very sweet, especially if you tend to them and, and take good care of them. They're very sweet. And, and, you know, if you've got kids, this is also a great learning experience for your children. And again, they don't require a lot of space. They don't require a lot of, um, 
They don't require a lot of maintenance, so to speak. So a lot of people just don't know enough about chickens to know that that's even a possibility, but owning your own chicken um, is not a bad idea. Is camper food, astronaut food okay to purchase? Yeah, Carmen Cita, that's a great question. What you have to look for, so like if you go to like REI and you look up some of these, you know, the dried packet packets of food, like the astronaut, the really highly dehydrated food that you add water and you boil it and you make a meal out of it. A lot of that is loaded with MSG. A lot of it's loaded with gluten. So it depends on if you have any other types of food restrictions in your diet that you're trying to follow. A lot of that food is garbage. It's full of hydrogenated oil and it's full of high levels of MSG. Um, so it's, you know, if you're, again, if you're planning ahead for healthy, it, it's not something I would encourage you to purchase because it's also very expensive. Uh, same, the same things with like MREs, meals ready to eat. And, you know, I was in the military and so those foods are very dense in c calories, but also for people with food allergies and health issues, not immune disease, not the best thing to store. Now, certainly eating something and not starving is better than not having anything at all to eat, right? So eating, having something, even though it may not be the healthiest for you and not starving is better than starving, right? But if you've got time now to plan, so again, that's the whole point of planning is you, is you plan ahead so that you don't have to pick and choose what is maybe not healthy for you later. Um, let's see here. Yeah, as your standard, Sharon mentioned as your standard, which is a great delivery, uh, a great delivery service for organic foods and pasture raised meats. Among, among other things. But again, with that type of deal, as your standard is also notoriously, um, uh, they have a reputation for missing their shipments or for not having product in stock that they can get to you because with real food, it's not predictable. Farming is a non, I mean, it's not 100% of a predictable thing. We've tried to make it more predictable through GMO and through you know things like Roundup Ready Seeds and things of that nature, but in making farming more predictable, we've also made people more predictably sick. Um, so if you're talking about real food, it's a lot less predictable. And so even, even being part of a co-op, sometimes you don't always get what you think you might get, which again, goes back to planning instead of, you know, depending on others to plan for you when, when the planning for them might not have worked out the way they thought it was going to work out. Margie says apartment dwellers cannot buy in bulk. We only have freezer space for a maximum of two weeks. Okay, so you may not have the freezer space, Margie, but you can buy canned goods and you can certainly make space in a closet in your apartment. You know, I, I was in a 600 foot apartment when I was in graduate school um, with kids in tow. And so I understand being in an apartment and having limited space, but you can still plan ahead with canned goods. Let's see here. Yes, people do provide or, or people eat food that provides stimulation and comfort. But again, we, 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 we want the comfort of having healthy food so that we can maintain our health. Like Cynthia mentions that you can salt and water ferment your food to preserve it. You can do that and that's part of canning. So you can take cabbage and vegetables and you can put them in a, in a salt ferment and, and it takes a couple of weeks, but then you can can those things and put them on the shelf and they'll last for a very, very long time and be a good backup for you and a healthy backup with lots of probiotics. Yeah, Yvonne's chiming in about Australia. She says food production in Australia is an essential service and restaurants are doing better without uh, better with takeout and delivery at this point. Not a great deal of shortages yet. Look, Yvonne, I hope I hope I'm just asking you all to to prepare for this and it nothing happens. Like my ultimate wish is that what I'm talking about tonight never comes to any type of fruition where none of you really need the backup food. Um, and that it's that it's all going to work out okay again, it, and that may be the case. I'm not trying uh, not trying to incite panic. I just want you to be prepared because, um, you know, again, lack of pre preparation can lead to some problems. Cheryl says, Doctor O, with all due respect, doesn't doom and gloom pr predictions affect our health in a bad way? Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying, Cheryl, and I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. I don't want you to all to think again. I've mentioned this a number of times. I'm not trying to to say that what I'm saying about food shortages is a definite and it's going to happen, but we have to look at the world around us and see what's already happened. There are already food shortages for lower income folks. Food banks are running out of food in a number of areas. The, the cars are lined up hundreds deep and they don't have enough food to meet the demand. 
so we already see food shortage in a sense. We see certain farmers, you know, going back to what I said earlier is we have, we have the, the supply, the farms haven't changed. We have the food. Farms are no different, but the farmers go to the processing plants. And if the plants can't process the food, then the farmers, in some cases, they're having to kill or dump the food so because they don't have any way to sell it. It goes bad, so they're dumping it. And so it's not an issue of really even a food shortage as much as it is a, flu a food supply chain disruption issue that we, you know, again, we've already seen is some of it starting to happen. And, and you can't predict what's going to happen come October and November. And again, if the world has the same response let's say a few cases of COVID-19 show up in the fall, if the world has the same kind of response that it had, you know, here back in January, you know, we may be in for a really, really tough year. And I just want you to be prepared for that. That's not doom and gloom. That's intelligent preparation. There's a big difference between shouting that the sky is going to fall and being ready in case the sky does fall. And so take, take it with that in mind and that in heart. Um, Angela says, what are the best gluten-free, sugar-free, low-carb to stock up on for diabetics who do not want to take pharmaceuticals? Um, if you're talking about food, just any food, any real food, stock up on, on um, canned vegetables, canned organic spinach, canned green beans, things of that nature. Um, stock up on, on healthy, lean, grass-fed uh, meats and, and, and free-range uh, bird. And, uh, or, or if you've got a hunter in the family, um, you know, wild game, or, you know, if you like fish, wild caught fish, you know, those are the things again, and you can stock up on those things in canned form. You don't have to necessarily have a deep freeze. You can buy all those things in a can as well. Let's see here. What do you think about those advertised survivor kits? Oh gosh, are we going to go there? I guess we can. Uh, good question, Dickerson. So, you know, from a survivalist perspective, um, and this is just a survivalist perspective. This doesn't mean that the world is coming to an end and that everybody needs to learn how to, you know, get their own bowstring from uh, horsehair and learn how to, you know, f make their own bow and arrows and, and, you know, hunt in that fashion. But you know, a survivalist kit, if we're talking about food survivor kits, it depends on the food that they're using and the quality and the ingredients. But if you're talking about like tools of survival, you know, what, what sh should you stock tools of survival? I think you should. Will you need them as a result of, of COVID-19? You know, hopefully not. Hopefully none of us will. But, um, you know, should you have a knife? Yes. Should you have an ax? Yes. Should you have basic tools? Of course you should. Um, you know, I'll even go one up. I live in Texas, and many of you may hate me for saying this. I don't know how you all feel about, about guns and gun ownership, but I believe it's our constitutional right. Not only is it our constitutional right to own guns, but it's really our constitutional obligation uh, to, be, to, be concerned, cons to be concerned citizens. And, you know, living in a democracy where the government should fear the citizenry and not the other way around. And it seems like with COVID, it's turned the other way around where government has laid out all the rules and citizens are now concerned about their freedoms. Uh, I believe that as, as, as freedom loving peoples um, that desire the ability to, to maintain their own personal sovereignty and protect their family, you have not only a right to own a gun, but you have an obligation to be a gun owner. Um, and that, that's just my personal opinion. Take, take of that what you will. But I think that should be part of your survival kit as well if we're talking about survival. Um, let's see. What do you feed chickens? You feed chickens grass. If they're truly free range, you feed them grass. Now, chickens, are, as a bird, can eat grain. But if you're going to feed them grain, you need to meet, make sure you're feeding them organic grain and not the genetically modified uh, garbage. They can also eat flax. They can eat a number of different types of seeds. So you can feed chicken flax seed. You can feed them sunflower seed. We actually grow sunflowers to harvest the seed to help feed our chickens. Um, you can feed chickens mealworms. You can you can grow your own mealworms um, and and uh, produce mealworms. We have a little mealworm farm for our chickens that we help grow mealworms in. Again, there's a big learning curve to to farming. So now is not the time. The emergency time is not the time to get through the learning curve. Start getting educated about it now in case you ever do need it. Yeah, so Cora says a lot of cities allow chickens in city limits, and that's true. They just limit you to a certain quantity. And that's, again, that's why they're a great potential great pet. 
It's the roosters that crow that make the noise. Chickens are really quiet, quiet animals. Let's see here. Yeah, walk-in closet as a pantry. If you've got a spare closet in your house, you can, you can certainly do that. Uh, let's see here. Are fermented vegetables safe for someone with liver issues? Yes, they are, certainly. Um, why wouldn't they be um, perfectly safe for somebody with liver issues? I like that, Lisa. Lisa says it's best to be self-sufficient as possible, not just for this situation, but for anything that may come in the future. Agreed. This is not, again, we don't know what the future holds. Nobody could have predicted what happened this year, last year. And you don't know what the next six months are going to hold, but we do. There are some observations we can make about the world and about the food supply right now. That if you're if you're looking at those things and you're not preparing, I think you're a fool, and you're going to make your own bed and lie in it if you're not prepping, and you're going to make your own bed and lie in it if you are. Um, can you? Um, not sure I understand your question, Lisa. Can you? Can you can sprouts? Oh, oh, can I? Can you actually physically can sprouts? I've never canned sprouts before. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't have any experience with canning sprouts. Maybe somebody else uh, out there in our tribe can chime in about that. Yeah, I mean, Stephanie made some good points. If you want to increase your risk of, of dying um, by COVID-19, don't consider your health. She's basically saying... Um, you know, being overweight increases your risk. So now's the time. Somebody mentioned weight loss earlier. If you're eating healthy, the likelihood that you're going to be overweight is vastly diminished. Um, let's see. Okay. Um... A lot of great comments here. Uh, somebody said, Cora said, let the chickens debug your garden. And they are. They're actually really good at debugging the garden. The problem with chickens, though, if you have a garden, they also eat your produce, especially if you have things like berries. we got strawberries and blueberries and things of that nature. They will eat those to the nub. So you got to be careful about letting chickens in and debugging all of your garden because uh, they'll, they'll debug your fruit, too. Let's see here. Let's keep going. Um, talk about Pepsi helping elderly survive COVID. Um, I, I wouldn't comment on that because I don't believe that Pepsi does help the elder, elderly survive COVID. I would say the opposite is true. Pepsi suppresses stomach acid, which is a big part of our immune system's capacity to defend us from viral infection. And one of the ways that COVID can penetrate into the body is through receptors in the GI tract, which it can only really bypass if there's not enough stomach acid to help suppress, uh, to suppress that. So I wouldn't go so far as to go out and start taking that medicine in, in, a, in a hope that it's going to somehow prevent COVID. Let's see here. We have nothing. Um, yeah, so food prices, what am I thinking about food prices? Um, I think they're going to go up. I think, the, But I think inflation is naturally going to happen when you inj artificially inject printed money into any economy. I don't, I don't think it's just food that we're going to see the price increase. I think we're going to see interest rates go up. I think we're going to see you know, a natural inflation. That's again, that's just my anticipation. So, you know, in trying to plan for that, it's another reason why buying food today at today's dollar um, might be if you've got, you know, if you've got, you might, if you're not been driven out of business or been driven out of, out of fine, if you haven't been driven to financial uh, struggles as a result of being not able to work uh, from this whole thing, if you've got the money, um, you're going to buy you're going to you're going to buy food at today's rate and not at tomorrow's and so i think you're probably going to be better protected in that way if you can let's see here 
Yeah, Ron. Ron says, "Remember Ukraine under Stalin, right?" Um, I get, I get where you're going with that. Um, you know, communism and and well, communism starts with socialism, and 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 again, I don't want to get political, um, but but socialism starts with taking other people's stuff and distributing it to other people, which is, you know, which is part of what we're seeing happen with the CARES Act, right? Is that we've taken the taxpayer dollars and we're redistributing all that money into other people's hands. And, and a lot of the people that have re been rewarded with that money are big corporations who don't need it. And so again, um, I think it's serving to just make the people who actually need it uh, more bankrupt. And, and when the taxpayers are bankrupt and the, and, and, and the, and the value of the dollar and the currency goes down, we're all going to be, you know, in a pickle. Uh, let's see. Let's see here. And you guys are going crazy, <laughs> going crazy in the comments, not crazy bad, but just a lot of good stuff. So I think I answered that question already. Um, let's see. Go, yeah, they go down there, Mel. Uh, let's see. Vit somebody's asking a question about vitamin E deficiency taken a gram daily. I, I, I don't know. I think why can't you kick your vitamin E deficiency if you're taking a gram a day? Uh, it could be that you're not absorbing the fat very well. It could be that you um, have a greater internal need right now for vitamin E. It could be you have an underlying disease that's increasing the demand for it. There's a lot of different reasons why. Let's see. Uh, answered that question already. Uh, do I see this ever truly ending? I, I don't. Yeah, I do. I think there's, I mean, I'm not an, I'm not a, um, I'll, I'll say I'm not a pessimist. I don't think that, that, you know, everybody's talking about the new America and the new norm. I think that's, um, I think that's language on purpose, just like the social distancing is language on purpose. Look, there's no valid studies that show social distancing reduces viral spread. Uh, I think it was a political construct, and I think the terminology is designed to get um, to get the undereducated masses to bully everyone else into believing that that's somehow the right thing to do, and that keeps the con the population under control. That's what I truly think. Um, just like the new norm, I think that's that's new language. I think that's language so that they're preconditioning everyone psychologically to expect less food, to expect less money, to expect less freedoms. And I think that's that's a very, very dangerous thing to prep your mind for. I think the best thing you can do is prep your mind for abundance. And the way that we prep our mind for abundance is we give abundantly, we share abundantly, we work abundantly, and we think abundantly. And you don't think in terms of, of be, you know, some people are thankful for everything that they have, not that you shouldn't be, but you should never, ever be thankful uh, that the government somehow stepped in and saved you from disease and you should never be thankful that the government steps in and gives you handouts because government handouts are not the answer here. The, the real answer is is every one of us pulling up, rolling up our sleeves and, and getting back getting back into this thing and, and, and taking care of ourselves and our families and our communities. I mean, why do you think I spend an hour every week with everybody in my in my community? It's because I care about you. I love you and I want to help you. Um, and I know that the, the, the more I can help you, the better our community is going to be and the more people you can share that message with and help them. Let's see here. <laughs> Jody says, laugh out loud, Farmer Osborne. You know it. Um, this is the time in the world where you should be Kindling, you know, rekindling those types of things. Um, dry bean variety is a great thing to store. Yeah, dry beans last a really long time. Canned beans last a really long time. If you've got the stomachs and the GI tracts for it, can certainly be a good part. I mean, they're a good source of protein. They're a good source of carbohydrate. A lot of you asking, the, you know, kind of the time frame 
um, if you're, if you're trying to pl plan for now, I mean, I think you need to at least have a couple of months on hand is what I would suggest. And, and you know, some of you may, that may not be a possibility. Have as much as you can afford, uh, to put away, you know, again, beyond, I don't think you need to really look beyond a year. I, I certainly would think that that would be maybe a little bit of overkill, although some would probably disagree with me on the under, other end of the spectrum. Um, but but uh, several months, you know, let's get get through. I, I think if you're planning to get through next winter, you're probably thinking pretty intelligently because I, I personally believe that what may happen is that the government may try to come down and pass some more draconian measures over COVID maybe resurfacing in the fall. And I think you should all be prepared for that real, very real possibility. Um, and again, that, that doesn't mean it will happen. But again, prepare it, prepare for it. I like what David says. He says self-sufficient uh, self -sufficient doesn't mean do it alone. Family, friends, neighbors can make a big difference by working together. Some can purchase commodities, tools, and equip. Others have skills, experiences, and knowledge. And knowledge. And, and I would say, yes, you should, you should be thinking about who are your friends and family members and what skill sets do they have and, and how does that kind of complete your community should you need a skill set, you know? And that, that, you know, it's not a bad idea preparing, uh, preparing in that way and thinking it through in that way. Okay. So Sherry says, go down on the, on the Facebook feed uh, for Sherry. Uh, President Trump spoke of disinfecting the blood. I think he's talking about ultraviolet blood radiation. Can you explain it? Yeah, so a lot of people were really picking on, on Trump, you know, because they were ignorant of the fact that disinfecting the blood doesn't happen with Lysol. Um, no moron. You know, one of the reasons why I think I'm going to just be blunt. One of the reasons why the country is in the state that it's in is because of attorneys. And the reason why, if you look at a plastic sack that a, a product comes in and you have to have a label on there that says, don't wrap it around your kid's head is because people don't take self-responsibility in there. And, and I won't even call it ignorance because ignorance, uh, ignorance means you don't have the knowledge, but I would call it stupidity. And so it's the same thing with the media trying to trying to call out Trump as saying he wanted people to put Lysol in their bloodstream. Ultraviolet radiation is a known therapy. It's been around for well over 50 years. In the 40s, there were some great research studies on, on radiating the blood as a, as a mechanism to treat infection and very successfully. And so I think I, I don't know what Trump meant because I'm not Trump. I can't pretend that I know what he's thinking or what's in his head, but but when you watch it in its entirety, when you watch what was said, that what it tends me to lead, lead me to believe is that he wasn't talking about injecting Lysol. What kind of a moron would say that? I think he was talking more about some of the research on uh, using radiation for the blood uh, as a disinfectant for viruses, bacteria, and other pathological microorganisms. Okay, I like that. Lisa says, the, oh, she asked the question, what's the best resource that you know of for foraging? Uh, it depends. There's not one great resource, Lisa, because with foraging, it, it's geographically different. So like in my area, for example, we're in, in South Texas. And so what we forage here might be very different than what you can forage in Missouri or California. I think looking up field manuals where you can learn to recognize and identify certain edible plants based on your geographic location would be best if you uh, so and to my knowledge, there's not like one book that's going to encompass that all. But if you if you find and do an Internet search and find the information from a reliable resource online and maybe think ahead about printing some of that information out and having it on hand, should you need to start using it? Um, Matthew Gibbs, thoughts on investing at this time in the future? I, yeah, I do have thoughts, but by no means am I a qualified financial advisors. So please don't take this as, as me telling you to go invest all of your money in one area or another. I think, I think the best thing that you can do if you're invested in the market is to stay and don't pull out. And the, in the, yeah, your money's down. Yeah, you, you've lost and seen 30 and 40% losses over the past several months. But the reality is if, if, if the world makes a comeback, and we all anticipate that it will, we all hope that it will, and, and certainly optimistically, in the past it always has, uh, then your money and your value, if you pull out now, you're, you're, you're taking a 30, 40% hit. But if you leave it in there and just leave it alone, as long as you don't need it, as long as you don't need it to survive on, 
that money will come back. I would say right now, if you're thinking about if you have ex extra money to invest and you already invest in like a 401k or a growth stock mutual fund group or something along those lines, right now is the time to invest because you're getting everything on sale. You're getting it 30 or 40 percent cheaper. And if the market makes a rebound, you'll have you know, you'll have that you'll have that that lower buy in, you know, and then so a lot of people don't realize they get panicked and they pull their money out at the low thinking it might go lower and they end up just losing 30% of their life saving. Anyway, uh, like I said, I'm not a financial advisor. I don't, I don't want to pretend to know the most about that. The best thing you could probably do is talk to your financial advisor, somebody who's trained in that and has, a, has a, an intelligence factor much greater than, than my personal opinion. Okay. Can chewing cocoa leaf lead to addiction? Well, um, yes, it can. Um, any drug, in, you know, whether it's, you remember plants, just because they're plants and natural doesn't mean that they don't have drug-like properties that could potentially lead to addiction. But the answer to that is yes. I, I'd say it depends on your predisposition to, to addictive behaviors and habits. Some people have greater predisposition than others. And I'd also say it depends on the quantity of use. Um, let's see. If I take my pills after I eat and they make me sick, should I move to the middle of my meal? Yeah, that might help. If you, if you eat a little bit of food and then take your supplements and then eat a little bit more food, sometimes that, that wrapping like that will make you less nauseous if, if they are making you nauseous. <laughs> Greg, you, you're really asking me a question here. Do I take drugs ever for recreation? No, I don't. Um, not, not, well, define what you mean by drugs. So no, do I take, do I participate in, in marijuana? Do I participate in mushrooms or any, uh, any of the other drugs that many people use as recreation based drugs? No, I don't. I, I like to have full control over my faculties and my brain. Uh, and in that regard, I, I don't like something taking over that control so that I could potentially make a mistake that could alter my life unfavorably or alter the lives of the people that I love unfavorably. Uh, let's see. Dwayne wants to know my thoughts on gadolinium. Uh, I would say, look, if, you're, if your doctor, if your endocrinologist wants you to get an MRI with and without contrast, you should get full disclosure on what gadolinium can do. Most of them will tell you it'll be out of you in a couple of weeks. My, my experience is I get people all the time where we test their heavy metals and we find that five years ago they had a gadolinium contrast and they still have toxic high levels of gadolinium floating around in their bloodstream. So, but that's not the case for everyone. I would say it depends on the individual. Me personally, my question to the endocrinologist would be, what is the benefit of getting the contrast versus just a regular MRI. Is the contrast gonna give you so much more information that it allows you to make a much more intelligent decision about what you think might be wrong with me? Or are we just injecting me with dye so that we can get a minute benefit uh, of a better image? I, 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 that would be the question that I would have for him. Let's see here. Somebody's asking, should I cook pea protein powder in a pressure cooker to destroy the lectin? No, it's already been cooked, so you don't necessarily have to worry about, about that. Uh, I'm not sure I understand this question from Asher. Can we still see our chiropractic? Um, you mean, can you still go to your chiropractor? It depends on the state that you're currently in and what they've done uh, as far as chiropractic being an essential or a non-essential. Um, Barbara wants to know what I think of Laura Seiden for autoimmune disease. I, I don't think a one size approach to any supplement fits any f particular autoimmune disease. I think it depends on what you might be using it for and what was actually objectively measured that makes you think you might need it. Um, so Dorothy wants to know my opinion on a COVID vaccine. Here's my opinion on a vaccine. First of all, um, those of you who are waiting around and shelter in place for a COVID vaccine, I'll just say it like it is, you're fools. 
Um, no vaccine has has eradicated influenza or any other virus for that matter. So if you're going to sit around and wait for your life to begin on a vaccine, when the track record of vaccines eradicating viral infection is abysmal at best, even the influenza, you know, the estimation is it doesn't work most years uh, with an efficacy rate that is very low and the potential for it to cause autoimmune disease, which is very real. And if you're listening to me, it's probably because you already are at risk or, or have had an autoimmune disease then, then, you know, you should, you should weigh that because vaccines, you know, one of the agents in vaccines are what are called adjuvants and adjuvants are designed to agitate the immune system. And what they actually serve to do is they serve to distract your immune system from its daily functions and strictly take all of the resources of, of daily function, all going toward whatever they're inoculating you with or whatever vaccine they're pumping into you. And so now your, your immune system is being distracted from everything except for one thing. And so now you're at greater risk for other things happening to you. This is why a lot of the research on vaccines show that people that get mass vaccines, there's, I mean, if you watch, there's a great documentary going on right now, and I've posted and sent an email out about it called The Truth About Vaccines. And look, I don't care whether you're a, a anti-vax and against it or whether you're for it. I don't care. It, I'm not going to judge you one way or the other, and I, wouldn't ho I would hope that you wouldn't judge me either. What I'm for is informed consent. Informed consent means if you're going to do it, you should know what the risks are. And what we know about the track record of the United States government dis displaying those risks is we know the government was just sued and they now have to take off of their website. The CDC now has to take down the fact that vaccines don't cause autism because they couldn't prove that there was any research studies that they had actually conducted that proved that vaccines don't cause autism. So all that you've heard in the media and on the news about how vaccines don't cause autism, you should know the government was sued and they have to reverse that position because they can't prove that vaccines don't cause autism. And if you, like I said, if you're waiting around for a COVID vaccine to be the savior of your life, um, stop it. Shame on you. No vaccine is the answer to your health. The answer to your health is taking discernible, intelligent action to improve your health. And how can you do that? You can do that with the right food. You can do that with sunshine. You can do that with exercise and sleep and love and spiritual guidance and awakening around you. And, and you can do that through community and you can't do that through a drug. No drug, no passive therapy, no passive treatment is going to fix your broken behaviors. And if you go around thinking that, that you're somehow going to be a better person if you get that vaccine and that other people are going to be evil because they wouldn't get the vaccine, then you're the problem, not the solution. And, uh, and, and you're willing to give up your freedoms and your ability to, to basically control your own power in, in making good decisions and you're willing to give those decisions to somebody else who doesn't love you, who has a track record of poor trust, um, then again, you're a fool. And, and then and you'll, you'll make your bed and you'll lie in it if that's the route that you choose to go. But again, I, I, you know, that's my opinion. Uh, I like all the comments. They would have to hog tie and gag me. They'd have to do more than, to me than that. They'd have to kill me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down alive uh, with a vaccine. Um, not, not unless they could peer, prove beyond the shadow of a doubt that it was safe and effective. And to date, we don't have any studies that show that any of those are, that fit in that category. Uh, no, we didn't eradicate polio. There's, that's one of those kind of myths of history. You have to understand that hygiene eradicated polio and, and before the polio vaccine was ever even created, hygiene, uh, had already diminished polio down to, to very, very low numbers. So no, no, a vaccine did not eradicate polio more than hygiene. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot, a lot of you chiming in. I mean, I mean, look, I'm not anti-government and I'm not anti-establishment either. Are there aspects and people in the government that are good people? Yeah, there are good people everywhere. But are there also bad people and bad aspects of the government? Yes. My point being is the track record of the CDC is lying to us about drugs and about having behaviors that are, you know, basically monetarily uh, monetarily gain behaviors. I just, I'm not going to trust somebody who's got, who's got, um, a hand in the game who stands to make millions of dollars over whether or not we make the decision to do something when the information might be actually a lie and detrimental to us. Okay. Uh, let's see. I think we covered almost all of them. I, we're, I know we're out of time. So I think at this point, folks, go home, don't panic, 
The show was not intended to make you panic. It was intended to make you think, and it was intended to make you prepare for the potential possibility that a food shortage might be a very real concern. And if it isn't, and I, and I hope to God that it isn't, you know, I'm, I'm hoping that you're all just preparing and planning because, because it's the smart thing to do and that you never have to tap into what you plan for because the worst case scenario would be that we all needed this plan to work uh, to survive. And that would be a very, very real scary scenario or outcome. So again, I'm just trying to help you understand that, you know, preparing is the best thing that you can do right now. Remember, you remember that we can only control the factors and variables that we have control over. And this, at this point in time is a very critical junction, uh, where you do have the capacity to control and to make decisions that will improve your potential ability to take care of yourself and your family in the next several months. And so take advantage of this window, because if you don't, and the window goes away and we do need the preparation, you're not going to have it. So, um, Love you all. Have a great week. Wishing you all safety and health. And we'll see you next week on another episode of Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.